In this recording, we're going to explore a little bit more about units and zero divisors. So the very first thing that I want to do is I actually want to uh, look at uh, recalling the two basic definitions. Um, if we have uh, a ring with an identity element and we pick any guy inside this particular ring and a has a multiplicative inverse that we usually denote as A inverse, uh, then we call A a unit inside the ring R. So the units are just the people who have multiplicative inverses. So um, if we have an inverse, then that basically means that we have a unit. As a quick example, inside the uh, ring of integers, the units are simply uh, 1 and negative 1. Um, 1 is always going to be a unit because 1 times 1 is equal to 1, and negative 1 is a unit because negative 1 times negative 1 is equal to uh, positive 1. And um, so those are the only two guys inside Z that ha are said to be invertible or that are units. The next definition that we want to look at is the definition of a zero divisor. And this is also not new to us because this was in the last video. Um, and this does not necessarily require a ring with identity. So in this case, we're just let, going to let R be a ring. And if A happens to belong to R, and uh, we know that A is not zero, and there exists a B in R with B not being equal to zero, and importantly, A times B is equal to zero, then we call A a zero divisor. It's also important uh, to understand that technically we are defining a left zero divisor here. Um, if there exists a C inside R with C not equal to zero and C times A is equal to zero, <coughs> then we call A a right zero divisor. And the phrase zero divisor basically means A is either a right zero divisor. Let's see, let's get that cleaned up. So a right zero divisor or a left zero divisor or both. Um, so it doesn't matter if we can only find an element on one side that works or if we can find elements on both sides that work. Uh, one thing that I do want to make a note of is that um, if R is a commutative ring, then A is a left zero divisor if and only if A is also a right zero divisor. And it's important to understand that the, the reason why this is true is, is absolutely trivial. Um, in a commutative ring, so in a commutative ring, uh, if AB is equal to zero, then BA 
is also going to be equal to zero. And so um, the element A would be a left zero divisor on that side, and he's a right zero divisor over here. Um, it's worth noting, too, that B is a right zero divisor there, and B is a left zero divisor here. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's do a quick example for zero divisors as well. If I look at the uh, ring Z8, uh, then 2 and 4 are clearly zero divisors because in Z8, 2 times 4 which is equal to 8, is congruent to 0 mod 8. So 2 times 4 is equal to 0 in Z8. Now, um, the basic definitions give rise to an obvious question. So I want to think about this question. Can a unit be a 0 divisor? And uh, vice versa, could a zero divisor be a unit? In other words, are these two things um, completely separate ideas, or are they? is it possible for something to be both of them? And what I want to do is I want to explore the idea. So we're going to explore the idea as follows. So let's explore. And here's how we're going to explore the idea. We're going to let r be a ring with a, with a multiplicative identity, so a ring with a one element. And we're going to let a be an element of r uh, with a being a unit. And um, so what I know here is that there exists an a inverse inside r such that a times a inverse is equal to a inverse times a, and both of those are equal to the multiplicative identity in R, which we'll denote as 1 sub R. Uh, so we know that, that a is a unit says that. And now let's assume that a times b actually is equal to 0 inside the ring R. And again, this is the additive identity of, um, of R, so I'm going to indicate that as a 0 sub R, because it's possible that R is not a collection of numbers. R might be um, a matrix group, for instance. Uh, so let's start out with this particular assumption and see where this takes us. So what can we say when this situation happens. Well, uh, let's see. Let's look at this idea. I'm going to start off with 1. Now, 1 can always be written as 1 plus 0. Uh, this is because of, and this is in R, so the 1 in R can be written as 1 sub r plus 0 sub r. This is just because 0 sub r is the additive identity inside ring r. Now what I want to do is I want to use these two facts. I'm going to use this fact up here to substitute in for the 1, and I'm going to use this fact here and substitute that in for the 0. And so the next step that we're going to get is that 1 can be written as a times a inverse plus a times b. So this is because a is a unit, and we've already assumed that a times b is equal to 0. That's our main hypothesis. And it's important to point out that a is a unit explains that substitution, and this explains that substitution. 
Okay, well, what I want to notice now is we are set up for the distributive law. We have an A out front in both of these two terms. And because the A is on the same side of the term, I can factor. And when I do, we wind up getting that 1 is equal to A times A inverse plus B. And this would be by our left distributive law. Well, let's see. I want to remember something else now that is truly important that we discovered a few videos back. So I'm going to recall a really important fact. We know that when A has a multiplicative inverse, that multiplicative inverse is unique. And what I want to look at is this is a situation where we have A times mess is equal to 1. And that says this mess has to be A inverse. Uh, we can also see that by pre-multiplying this whole equation by A inverse if we want to. In other words, we can write this next step in two different ways. And I think what I'm going to do is sort of do it in both both ways. The fact that we've got stuff being unique lets me say, and I jump a little bit further than I want to, what we have is that this equation here will imply that A inverse is equal to A inverse plus B. That's, I don't need that parenthesis. And this is since A inverse times 1 is equal to A inverse, and A inverse times A times A inverse plus B. When you put parentheses around these two things, you see that that's going to obviously be 1 inside the ring times A inverse plus B, and that will be A inverse plus B. So we can either use uniqueness or we can use this fact, but we still get down to understanding this. Now, once we have that, I can add the additive inverse of A inverse to both sides. So what I now have is that I can look at minus A inverse plus A inverse is equal to minus A inverse plus A inverse plus B. Um, inside my ring R. And when I put in parentheses, that's a zero and that's a zero. So our next step is going to say that we have the zero in the ring is equal to zero plus B. And that particular thing says zero is equal to B. Now what I want to do is capture what this actually says. So I want to think about what we've really done. What we've done, and I kind of want to go back up and look at it, is we've realized that if we start with these hypotheses, so if these are true, then we have succeeded in showing that the B element has to be zero. In other words, what we have done is we have proven the following proposition. We have proven that if we let R be a ring with a multiplicative identity, and we pick A inside R with A being a unit inside R, 
then if a times b is equal to zero, we know b has to be equal to zero. Now what this actually says is the following. This says if a is equal to a unit inside R, then a cannot be a, well, let's look at sides. The a here is on the left, and since I don't know about commutativity, I have to say that a cannot be a left zero divisor. Well, let's see, that brings up another question. So I'm going to look at this question now. If A is a unit inside R, can A be a right zero divisor? And I want you to think about that question for a few minutes. So stop the video, and I want you to investigate this. And I want to give you a little bit of hints on how to investigate it. So I want you to assume that A is a unit, and I want you to assume that B times A is equal to the zero inside the ring. Can you show that b is equal to zero. So I would encourage you to stop the video and actually try to do this. Hopefully you've stopped the video and now what I want to do is I want to investigate this myself so you can compare your proof to mine. So uh, we're going to assume that a is a unit and we are also going to assume that b times a is equal to the zero inside our ring. And what I want to look at this time is that a is a unit implies there exists an a inverse such that, such that a times a inverse is equal to a inverse times a is equal to one inside the ring. And we're going to start off with exactly the same thing that we did last time. 1 is equal to 1 plus 0. And we are going to look at this fact and this fact and plug this one in for the 1 and this one in for the 0. In other words, we're going to rewrite this as a inverse times a plus b times a. And, uh, gee, we can factor the a out. And what this says is that we have 1 in the ring is equal to a inverse plus b times a, and that says that a inverse plus b has to be the same thing as a inverse, and that is going to imply that b is indeed equal to the 0 inside the ring. And so what we now have is the following thing. We have now proved the important proposition that says this. Let R be a ring with identity. Let A be a unit in R. Then A cannot be a zero divisor inside R. Now the very last thing that I want to do is I want to look at the contrapositive of this particular statement. So the contrapositive of this statement is going to be negate this part. So A is a zero divisor inside my ring. So let R be a ring with 
a 1. Let A be a 0 divisor. And then we have to negate this part up here. Then A cannot be a unit. Now what this means is that in, in any kind of ring, we basically have several kinds of elements. Uh, so I want to look at that schematic for just a minute. So in any ring at all. We can think about the collection of elements in the ring as being just a big blob. Now, one thing that we notice is that there is a special element called the zero of the ring, and I'm going to partition him all by himself. And then we have the zero divisors. And if we happen to have a one, we would have the units. And if we have units, we also have to have a one, and the one will always be a unit because one is um, one times one is always one. And then we have a collection of things that are not zero, not units, and not zero divisors. And it's important to understand that outside of let's see outside of let's just change the color here outside of this chunk here this chunk has to have zero this is a singleton set these other sets in any given ring these other sets may be empty. But in any given ring, any element is going to fall into one of these three sets. It will either be a unit, if we happen to have a one, it will be a zero divisor, or it will be something that is neither a unit nor a zero divisor. And that is enough for this particular video.